Oh, hello. Thank you all for coming uh, this afternoon. And um, my name's Kevin Landis. I'm the uh, producer of the Prologue Lecture Series. And I have been excited about this, this talk for a long time. Uh, John Douglas Thompson was last here, I believe in 2016. Uh, and performed in his one-man show, Sachmo at the Waldorf, which I know some of you saw. A wonderful production, yeah. Um, I don't want to take time doing too much introductions. I hope you got the little, the little handout of, uh, of stuff that he has done. If you didn't, we'll have it outside at the cookies party that no one knows about until right now in the lobby outside of Goka um, afterwards. Um, I just want to thank, before I bring John out, I want to thank all the people who make Prologue possible. Of course, um, that is the Department of Visual and Performing Arts, the Dean's Office, uh, the Chancellor's Office here at UCCS, and theater works. So we're gonna talk about a lot over the next hour and 15 minutes or so, and then we'll get a chance to mingle, as I said. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce John Douglas Thompson. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> So nice to have you with uh, us. Pleasure to be here. I have so many questions. And what? Yeah. I just noticed the stars are. are There's stars and bees, yeah. Yes, they're really cool shoes. At first I looked at them and it was just, have you seen this? Can you show them, show them the shoes? Yeah, no. Okay, so here's the story on the shoes. And I say this first they were a gift. They're, they're so Gucci. Nice. These, oh, these of are the. Course. They, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> say no more. These are the. <laughs> Gucci. The fanciest thing I own, and I, it was a gift. Okay. Yes, I only wear them on very special occasions, and this is one. Okay. These are just boots. They're not. <laughs> By boots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> John, thanks so much. As oh, I, you know, we were pleasure. saying before, the last time, I, I think my, my math is right, it was in 2016 when you were doing Sachmo at the Waldorf, and you brought it out for us to see uh, at TheaterWorks over in the other building. Yes. And a smaller building. A much smaller building. Now in our, our fancy. <laughs> Less <spot>. impressive building. <laughs> well, I th you know, we want to talk a little bit about, about your bio, but, but of course, we brought you here because you are an expert on classical works and, and on the works of August Wilson. Theater Works is performing uh, King Hedley II. They're in, dress, they're in tech rehearsal right now, just next door, and so we're all kind of sharing a backstage. This mm -hmm. is sort of fun. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in theater and, and, and specifically uh, your interest in August Wilson? Ooh. Okay, how much time we got? Okay, it, an hour. Um, <laughs> um, I uh, started out as a, like all good young gentlemen, a computer salesman. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I went to a Jesuit high school, Jesuit college. Uh, yeah, my Jesuits here? He, I would. What? <laughs> what? Okay, awesome. Um, which gave me a, quite a, a well-rounded liberal education, liberal arts. And so I got a chance to study some Shakespeare in my English um, classes. Not plays, but just a little bit of that. So that's how I encountered Shakespeare. But at that point in time, I never really dreamed or thought of being an actor. I was on a track to be, to go to college, study business, marketing, economics, and from there, hopefully get a job at some Fortune 500 company and, and start my career and have a little house with a picket fence and a car <laughs> and a dog and two children, you know, all that stuff. Um, so when I got out of college, when I graduated out of college, uh, I moved to New Haven because I started a training program with a Fortune 500 company and that was called Burroughs at the time. It's now Unisys. It's all over the world, all over this country, for sure. Um, and when I was training, I met a young lady who was a Yale medical student. Uh, and we were friends, and I wanted to be more than friends. <laughs> um, so I asked her out on a date. Uh, and. I wasn't quite sure what to, to go to, and I wanted to impress her with my intellect <laughs> and my cultural sensibility. 
<laughs> and so instead of going to, you know, most time, go on a first date, it could be just to go out and get something to eat, maybe a movie, uh, sometimes a sporting event. And I wanted to impress her, so I thought of perhaps a museum, right? That's impressive. <laughs> Kind of. I thought of a museum, and then I also thought of maybe a play that would, just something that would really impress her and say, oh, this guy, he's on, he's, he's on to something. Um, so I asked her if she wanted to go see a play. There was a play at Yale Rep Theater, which was right around the corner from where I lived, um, and it was an August Wilson play called Joe Turner's Come and Gone. And uh, I asked her to the play. We picked the time and the date and everything. So I got to the theater, but she didn't. Um, so she didn't show up. Uh, at first I thought maybe it was just miscommunication, but she didn't show up. Because <laughs> I called her dorm. This is back then bef before these things, right? <laughs> when you had to go to a pay phone and dial. So I wasn't able to reach her, and I had a choice to either go my by myself or go home, quite frankly. I decided to go to the play. I sat with an empty chair next to me, and I watched this play, um, and it was remarkable. Uh, for me, I was in the process of having this experience, um, this foundational experience, um, because I'd never seen anything like it before. And not that I had not been to plays, I'd been to maybe one or two when I was in college, but nothing like this. This was a play that refracted and reflected back to me who I am, because there were people who looked like me um, in situations that were, if not part of my life, uh, certainly part of my future life, or part of my ancestors' lives, part of my father's life, my mother's life, uh, my sisters, my brothers. So I was able to see something in this play that was an immediate direct connection into my own life. And there were people who looked like me doing this. So it was quite a religious experience, if you will. And I knew in that process as I was watching, I do remember specifically asking God at that time, and not to say that I'm a super religious person, but on that moment I was, asking God if he or she could see what was happening to me as I was watching what I was watching. If God could make me what it is that I'm watching, which is, can you make me an actor? Make me able to do what I'm watching someone do to me. Give me that gift, because it was definitely a gift. So it was kind of an epiphany, and uh, I left the theater knowing that that's what I wanted to do from that moment on. Uh, I wasn't thinking about, quote unquote, the date that stood me up. I was very much focused on having the idea of being an actor. And so I left there. It took me another six and a half years for that to happen. I waited until I got laid off from this company. And then immediately I started to think about now's the time to become an actor. So I went to drama school, got out of drama school, uh, went into the world of acting. It took me about three or four years to get my first job, but I did get one and used that to get other jobs. But I, I think the more important thing out of this story is, is how plays can affect lives, right? Because without me seeing this particular play, I wouldn't be an actor. I know that for a fact. It had such a profound impact on me. And part of it is because of the reasons that I stated earlier. I was looking at people who looked like me, speaking words that had effect and experience in my own life, if not my own, my father's, my uncle's, my brother's, sister's, all that. So there was something quite communal and familial about what I was watching. And so that was my standard. That is theater. Uh, obviously, when I left and went out into the wider world, that's not exactly what I fully encountered, but I always thank August Wilson for giving me that initial experience. And I've said this before that August Wilson made me an actor, and William Shakespeare gave me a career. That's pretty much how it's happened for me. Um, and so that's, that's yeah. my experience with Wilson. You, you know, it, it, what you just said resonates with something you said to the students yesterday. You said, my family is my archetype. 
Yes. And 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 the idea that you just presented about about seeing yourself on stage, being yeah. able to say that's me. Um, uh, you know, you hear people talk about that with August Wilson a lot. Could you could you wrap that up into in, into sort of what we should know about August Wilson and the idea of family and the idea of of of, of the black experience in America uh, that he he did so beautifully. Well, I, I think prior to August Wilson, we had glimpses of it. You know, we had certainly Lorraine Hansberry, uh, her plays, particularly Raisin in the Sun. There were several other plays from other playwrights. And there was also someone like Eugene O'Neill who, who put black protagonist in his plays uh, because he had uh, certainly, from my perspective, a respect for the African-American experience in the United States, as well as he had for the Irish-American experience in the United States. Um, so there was, there was something about August Wilson saying to me and people who look like me that our lives are valuable, that we are worth it, right? That our lives are art, that the way my mother cooks and the way my mother talks with her friends, the way my father plays cards with his friends in the backyard, the way my father does work around the house, the way my brother talks to my sister, the way I talk to my brothers and my mother and father and my friends is art. It's worthy of being art. And that is huge because August Wilson made someone like me and people who look like me heroes. So there's very, something very Greek about what he did for the African-American life. So before him, there wasn't people actually doing that on such a broad scale and so concentrated, right? Because he told 10 plays decade by decade of the African-American experience in the United States. So it was quite amazing to feel like a hero to look at my life and say that it has value, it has art, um, it has greatness, um, it has essence, it has spirit, um, it has all the things that are necessary. So there's a value that he gave to me and people who looked like me. And I'm not even talking about actors. There were people that would go see his plays and see themselves in the characters and realize that they were valued. And I think that's a very important thing, particularly within the context of theater and American theater. So many groups, I said this before, you know, America's this big melting pot, this big democracy, this big melting pot. And to see yourselves reflected back to you in a play or in a movie is a very powerful device of self-identity. And if what you're getting back is negative, if you're seeing yourself but in a negative impression, that has an impression on you. So I felt what August Wilson did for the African-American and the African-American family and the African-American or the African diaspora was give value and credibility and integrity to our lives that did not exist within the American theatrical format. And when we went to see his plays, we had a certain amount of pride or it awoke a certain amount of pride in ourselves. And so that was something that he gave, not only to the African-Americans who watched the plays as audiences, but the African-American actors like myself who participated in them. And I think he was able to give some sort of historical context to all those people who were not black to say, this is black life. These are heroes. These are major protagonists in our everyday lives. So he took my everyday life and made me nobility, right? This is very important. And if I had not seen Joe Turner's Come and Gone, I wouldn't be an actor. Had I not seen that nobility on stage in action, I would not have dreamt to attain or have that position. So that's how powerful it is. So when I talk to people about August Wilson, there's a direct impact from seeing to believing to dreaming to doing. And just as, as you were saying, John, I was thinking the Pittsburgh cycle and, and you, you mentioned, uh, you know, you've mentioned Shakespeare, you know, it's almost biblical, right? You know, this, this 10 plays, right? Of yes. the Black I'm gonna just read them because Theater Works has done, well, this will be the fifth one that Theater Works has done of the, of the 10. 
Um, and to be doing them here in Colorado Springs is, is re really remarkable. 1900, Gem of the Ocean. 1910, Joe Turner's Come and Gone. 1920s, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. 1930s, The Piano Lesson. 1940s, Seven Guitars. 1950s, Fences. 1960s, uh, Two Trains Running. 1970s, Jitney. Uh, 1980s, King Haley's Headley II, which we'll all see. And then 1990s, um, Radio Golf. Yes. You. Um, got a Tony nomination for one of these plays. Uh, mm. Could you tell us a little bit about what it was acting on Broadway in Jitney, the 1970s epic? Yes, uh, we did a production of Jitney and uh, it's notable in the sense that that was the last, the final play of August Wilson's 10 plays to be put on Broadway. So it was the final crown or final jewel in the crown. And to give it even more context, no playwright has had their whole oeuvre, if you want to call it that, their set of plays all done on Broadway. August Wilson is the only person to have done that in the world, right? So he wrote 10 plays. Yes, it deserves a hand. So he wrote 10 plays and they all made it to Broadway and some of them more than once. So when we did Jitney, that was the final gem, if you will, completing the necklace of, of August Wilson's plays. And you know, it was quite a profound experience for me because I do think in, in plays with certainly really talented playwrights, you learn so much about yourself and the human condition. Um, me and my father, once I decided to become an actor, had kind of a breaking off. I come from a West Indian background and, and acting was not considered respectable or reputable. Um, it was, from my father's perspective, a hobby. Um, and my father, as all great parents do, work extremely hard for the benefit of their children. And my mother and father did the same, God rest their souls for me in getting me a good Jesuit education in high school and in college and wanting me to move into those wonderful fields of you know, being a lawyer, a doctor, or a salesperson. Um, so when I made the choice to become an actor, from my father's perspective, it was a betrayal. Um, and I never understood that. It, it, it hurt me to my core as what I did hurt my father to his core. So here I am working on this play, Jitney, which has a lot to do with fathers and sons. And there's a central relationship between my character that I played called Becker and his son called Booster. And Becker had put everything that he was and he is into his son and getting him a good education, raising him to be an impactful member of the community. He was incredibly smart and incredibly gifted. And Becker, I, as the father, was extremely proud of that. Uh, my son Booster got tangled up in a relationship and at the end of that relationship, he ended up killing the person that he was in the relationship with, which I, as Becker, his father, could not understand that behavior. That's not how I raised him. The mother, as well, my wife at the time, could also not understand. It was such a huge thing that the mother in the family passed away. It drove her to her death. My son, Booster, goes to prison. I never visit him over the course of 20 years. So the big thing in the play is Booster's getting out of prison, and he's going to come and visit his dad. And what is that going to be like? And so you see this relationship kind of unfold, the backstory of it, what happened, and why the father feels so betrayed and will not deal with the son. That relationship taught me a lot about the relationship I had with my father. Through playing the character Becker, I understood what it meant to feel betrayed by your son or your daughter, who you taught or raised to do nothing but good things in the world and something horrible happened. And it allowed me to mend my relationship with my father, to really understand where he was coming from and accept it and be open to it as opposed to be angered. Um, and it did a lot for me and my dad. And you know, certainly before my dad passed away, we were able to, I felt, certainly repair our relationship. And if it wasn't for that play, I don't think that would have happened. So plays can have an effect 
certainly in the storytelling aspect, but it can actually have a direct effect on one's life, as that play did in mine and my relationship with my father, in the same way that Joe Turner, or in a different way that Joe Turner had an effect on me making me an actor. You know what I mean? So I feel indebted, you know, to August Wilson and his writings and his characters um, because they've done so much in my own personal lives, let alone my career. I love that story. I didn't know that. But, you know, all of the praise that you got, the award nominations and awards for that that production, actually on the... um, it was about you and your dad and, and, and yeah. the reconnection that you had. That's, yeah, that's I mean, uh, that was the story inside the story. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? And, and I was, you know, it's rare that you come across something that teaches you a life lesson that allows you to bridge and reconnect with a member of your family or a friend, a lover, a close acquaintance um, before it's too late. And... My father, I remember, I was so proud. I, our play got a Tony nomination for Best Revival. I got a Tony nomination for um, Best Supporting Actor. And, you know, my, the, the biggest thing was I wanted my dad. I wanted to tell my dad about it and have him come to the show. But at that point, my father was too old to travel and come to New York City, get on a plane, get off a plane, make it into Times Square, go to the Tony Awards. It would have been way too much for my father to negotiate. But it was one of the proudest things of my life to be able to say that to my father. And then before my father had passed, to spend this quality time with him in full understanding of where he was coming from. And just able to answer that with love as opposed to animosity or anger or difficulty or aggression. Like, why won't you accept this? But totally able to understand where he was coming from. And just the effort to be his son in spite of all of that and love and take care of him. And so I'm proud that I was able to come to that place. And I'm happy that obviously it was the play that brought me there. And I never knew that going into the play. It was t- something totally by surprise. With that story and your relationship with your, f- your family, the idea of the family is the archetype, what, what Wilson yeah. does uh, with, mm. with the American family. The, you mentioned Shakespeare before as another of your great loves, and I know you hear this quote all the time, but I like saying it, even if it embarrasses you. Uh, who has a New Yorker uh, article on you? It says, John Douglas Thompson is the greatest Shakespearean actor of his generation. and. I've seen him on stage a lot. That's a lot, but it's true. I mean, he has a felicity with, with Shakespearean language like no one I've seen. Mm. It seems to me, and tell me I'm wrong on this if I am, but there's, a, there's, there's similarities in, the way, in, in Wilson's language and Shakespeare's language in this idea of you know, going yeah. back to the Greeks and, and yeah. the cyclical nature. You know, let me, let me back up a second. I have spoken to many people about using your own family as legacy and where that idea comes from or using your legacy in your acting. Uh, You are closest to your parents, to your brothers, to your sisters, to your cousins, to your nephews, to your uncles, aunts, because that is the blood that flows through you. And whether you like it or not, that's what's going to come out. But that theory, which is part of my acting theory, all comes from being exposed to August Wilson because I felt he wrote about his own legacy, his own family, people that he knew and saying that we are enough, we are valued, we are heroes and sheroes in our lives and the world needs to understand that. So that's the aspect of using legacy as an actor and it's a very powerful tool, I think it is. Um, So I just wanted to, to at least restate that. Now, the idea that there's similarities, and people have said this before, there's uh, calling August Wilson a bard like Shakespeare. There is something about their poetry, their language, their use of ideas, their construction of ideas, uh, their construction of scenes, uh, characters, and situations that are similar. And I felt, knowing Shakespeare, Certainly being in love with August Wilson and wanting to be an actor because of August Wilson and then going right into studying Shakespeare, I felt that gave me the facility to do August Wilson. Because before I did August Wilson, I fell in love with August Wilson as an audience member 
watching it on stage. I had not done it. I started working on Shakespeare well before I did my first August Wilson. But what I did notice is those similarities, construction of language, poetry. Um, there is, I felt in the August Wilson canon, a relentless poetry that is so engaging that it grabs the audience by the ears and says, listen to me. There is also a relentless poetry in Shakespeare but it's a little bit more transitory. It comes and goes, and I'm not making that and saying that Shakespeare is not as good as Wilson or Wilson is not as good as Shakespeare. I'm saying I consider them equals, but the reason is is because of the poetry that they put into their characters' mouths. But when I've done Shakespeare, that poetry exists and then pauses. When I've done Wilson, that poetry is relentless, it doesn't stop. It continues on to the end. And that's what I mean by grabbing the audience. And there's something about Wilson because the language is not as an antiquated as Shakespeare, it even sharpens the listener's ears because the words that are coming out of August Wilson are words that we all use. Whereas the words, and this is why Shakespeare for me is somewhat transitory in its poetry, because some of the words, many of the words are words we no longer use today. We have their contemporary equivalent, but we still don't use them. So they're both poetic, but they have, one has a contemporary effect on the audience's ear, and one has a classical effect on the audience's ear. So say more about that. When you talk, I mean, you just described it there, but when you think about Shakespeare's poetry, mm -hmm. I think we have a sense of that, as you said, an iambic pentameter and all those mm -hmm. sorts of things. Describe what you mean a little bit more by Wilson's poetry. Well, I, there's a, perhaps at least from my experience, there's a, there's a rapidity and a velocity to Wilson's poetry that keeps the ear hanging for the next word or the next line or the next statement. And I don't think he gives you a pause in the way that Shakespeare does, um, where there may be a pause for you to reflect on what you just heard. I feel with Wilson, you're following everything that you hear and it's all driving to a larger point. Um, uh, uh, and hopefully we'll get into, I'll, I'll do at least a reading of one or the other or both to at least hear it, <laughs> hear it and, and give you a, a more specific example. Um, but it is because Shakespeare was a long time ago, meaning and I, when I say classical context, we're talking over 400 years back, whereas Walt Wilson is much more dealing with the contemporary and let's say even when he was alive, dealing with language and situations that are very much a part of our distinct present and future and past that we all understand. Um, so there is the ability, I think, with Wilson for a greater understanding than there is with Shakespeare. Many of the things that I did with Shakespeare, although I understood them inherently initially, I had to go back and forth over it. When I heard Wilson, it was immediate the understanding, the level of who these characters were and what their lives were about became much more easy to understand off of the page and on the stage than when I did Shakespeare. Um, so that's what I, when I look at something that's classical, they say anything from 1920 before 1920 constitutes classical. Contemporary may be 1920 and into the future. Um, so that's just the, uh, a specific definition. But when I talk about language, and many of you may have witnessed this, when you read Shakespeare or go to a play and listen to Shakespeare, you will get it, but there are words that quite, that you may not understand that are the linchpins to the meaning. Yeah. Um, you may get it from the emotion of the character or the emotion of the scene, but you still might under understand that word. So that's much more of a classical context. You may have to look up the word to kind of fully understand it. And as an actor, I often do that to fully, to bridge uh, my understanding with Shakespeare's, his understanding from 400 years ago, my contemporary understanding now, then deliver that to an audience. But I never necessarily have to do that with a contemporary writer like August Wilson, because all that is on the tip of my head and on the tip of my tongue. And I know for audiences, it is the same. 
um, that they understand where I'm at with the language that I'm using um, immediately as opposed to after the fact. Well, you, you sort of teased it. So is there, uh, is there anything in here that, that would sort of express okay. that? Not, not read, in acting, but just yeah. to, to, to read some stuff so we get a sense of what we're gonna... Time we're, has moved on and reading glasses are necessary. <laughs> so I'll, I'll read some of uh, 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 Othello, um, um, which is also beautiful poetry. This is the speech that Othello gives uh, to the senators about the story of how he and Desdemona fell in love. Um, so that's all you need to know. Some of you probably know the play, so uh, who doesn't know the play? <laughs> and that's the bigger question, right? Okay. Here we go. Her father loved me, oft invited me, still questioned me the story of my life. From year to year, the battles, sieges, fortunes that I have passed. I ran it through, even from my boyish days to the very moment that he bade me tell it, wherein I spake of most disastrous chances, of moving accidents by flood and field, of hairbreadth scapes in the imminent deadly breach, of being taken by the insolent foe and sold to slavery, and my redemption thence, and portents in my travel's history, wherein of entrees vast and deserts idle, rough quarries, rocks and hills, whose heads touch heaven. It was my hint to speak. Such was the process. And of the cannibals that each other eat, the anthropophagi. Now, who knows what an anthropophagi is? <laughs> right? So I say that word and you... you, you Feign understanding, but it's like, I don't know what the hell he just said, <laughs> right? So that's just part of Shakespeare's poetry that we have to reflect back on and then assume that these anthropophagi were a particular kind of people in a particular place on earth that were very different from the general population that Othello ran into as an aspect of his mighty travels. He's traveled the world and seen things that other people, other human beings have just not seen. This is how worldly he is. So that's just a part of it. But I, I had to say that because even when I was working, I was like, who are the anthropophagi? Are they real? Okay, so anyways. <laughs> so it was my hint to speak, such was the process. And of the cannibals that each other eat, the anthropophagi, and men whose heads do grow beneath their shoulders. This to hear would Desdemona seriously incline, but still the house affairs would draw her thence. And ever as she could, with haste dispatch, she'd come again, and with a greedy ear devour up my discourse. I did consent and often did beguile her of her tears when I did speak of some distressed stroke that my youth suffered. My story being done, she gave me for my pains a world of sighs. She swore in faith, twas strange, twas passing strange, twas pitiful, twas wondrous pitiful. She wished she had not heard it, Yet she wished that heaven had made her such a man. She thanked me and bade me, if I had a friend that loved her, I should but teach him how to tell my story and that would woo her. Upon this hint, I spake. She loved me for the dangers I had passed, and I loved her that she did pity them. This only is the witchcraft I have used. Here comes the lady, let her witness it. Hmm. Beautiful. But, Thank, thank you very much. But I wanted to say, you see how there, there's poetry and then pause to reflect. 
uh, because I also felt that Shakespeare at the time that he was writing was trying to say to us, this is who we are. This is what we do when we are placed in particular situations. And the situation that Othello was placed in is having to, which he should never have to, prove to a group of senators the story of the love of how he and Desdemona fell in love. Who should have to prove that? To say that you're in love with someone should be proof enough. But because there's an element of this play that deals with racism, it seems as if there's something underhand has happened. So they're accusing Othello of witchcraft. So here, just imagine the situation. Here's this man who has fallen in love with this woman, who has also fallen in love with him, to speak of his person. These are intimate matters, but he's got to speak to them. Because if the people he's talking to don't believe him, then there may be hell to pay. Who knows what the price of that's going to be, right? Because he's dealing with these people who are now gonna pass judgment. But he tells such a beautiful story of the love that him and Desdemona have, that one of the first things one of the senators says, who's there to judge him, that one of the senators says, I think this story would win my daughter too, right? And then he goes off to war, and then the rest is history about the play, of course. So. As Othello is speaking to these senators, what you're actually experiencing is not only the story of how they fell in love, but you're also experiencing his humanity. And that's what wins the audience over to, to, to really like this individual, this general called Othello, who is the only black man in a predominantly white society, right? So there are so many ramifications that are current and contemporary in this classical play. And the poetry is what wins the day, but there is pause in the poetry for the character to reflect as well as for the audience. But that's poetry that grips your ear in a transitory way, but holds you, and then there's a pause, and maybe some words that are fairly understood or maybe not that connect one thing to another. So there's, it's holding you for a moment, letting you go, and then pulling you back into its grasp, at least from my perspective. Whereas August Wilson is relentless, and once he grabs your ear, he doesn't let it go until we get to the end of the speech, and then you've got the full effect of someone's life. So that's kind of the difference. Now I'm gonna read from a play by August Wilson that I did. It's called Joe Turner's Come and Gone. I was fortunate after having seen that play that made me an actor, 25 years later, getting the opportunity to play the role in the play that made me an actor. <laughs> so here, let, let, let's see if, if my theory is correct. <laughs> You're just testing it out for the first time. I'm testing time. <laughs> it out, this is all, yeah, this is, this is, we're all new to this, guys. Okay, so now this is, uh, the character that's here, his name is Harold Loomis, uh, that I'm going to read from. He was a pastor. Um, and there was a practice um, after or during Reconstruction uh, in America where if, um, if, uh, if anyone black, particularly black men, were seen either talking with one another uh, engaging with one another, going from one place to another, they could be arrested on what they would call like vagrancy. And then they would be pulled back uh, to working on some farm or some plantation. So it was another form of slavery. And they made them work off their charge of vagrancy by doing all this labor on a farm or a plantation. So many people who were, who, had, had, who were slaves in the past became slaves again um, for a period of time. That's what happened to Harold Loomis. He was there trying to talk to some people who were actually gambling and saying, don't gamble, and trying to talk them into coming to the church because he was a person who went out to save souls. The police saw this and rounded him up with all the other people that he was talking to, took them all off, and they worked on a farm for seven years as slaves, and then were freed. And 
So there's a point in the play where he's talking to some people about his past. Uh, there are two other individuals on stage that are talking and they've been working on Harold Lubins in a way because they want to hear about his past and they've been saying things that he can overhear and then all of a sudden he starts to speak about his past. So this is, the, this is his speech. Had a whole mess of men let me start again. Had a whole mess of men he'd catch just go out and hunting regular like you go out hunting possum. He'd catch you and go home to his family. Ain't thought about you going home to yours. Joe Turner catch me when my little girl was just born. Wasn't nothing but a little baby sucking on her mama's titty when he catch me. Joe Turner catch me in 1901, kept me seven years until 1908, kept everybody seven years. He go out hunting and bring back 40 men at a time and keep them seven years. I was walking down this road in this little town outside of Memphis, come up on these fellows gambling. I was a deacon at the Abundant Life Church. I stopped to preach to these fellows to see if maybe I could turn some of them from their sinning ways when Joe Turner, brother of the governor of the great sovereign state of Tennessee, swooped down on us and grabbed everybody there, kept us all seven years. My wife Martha gone from me after Joe Turner catch me gone out from under Joe Turner, got out from under Joe Turner on his birthday. I'm sorry, I'm gonna start again, but do you, you sense my theory? Okay, yeah. let me start again. Okay, here we go. Had a whole mess of men he catch, just go out hunting regular like you, go out hunting possum. He catch you and go home to his wife and family, ain't thought about you going home to yours. Joe Turner catch me when my little girl was just born. Wasn't nothing but a little baby sucking on her mama's titty when he catch me. Joe Turner catch me in 1901, kept me seven years until 1908, kept everybody seven years. He go out hunting and bring back 40 men at a time and keep them seven years. I was walking down this road in this little town outside of Memphis, come up on these fellows gambling. I was a deacon in the Abundant Life Church. I stopped to preach to these fellows to see if maybe I could turn some of them from their sinning when Joe Turner, brother of the governor of the great sovereign state of Tennessee, swooped down on us and grabbed everybody there, kept us all seven years. My wife Martha gone from me after Joe Turner catch me, got out from Joe Turner on his birthday. Me and 40 other men put in our seven years and he let us go on his birthday. I made it back to Henry Thompson's place where me and Martha was sharecropping and Martha's gone. She taken my little girl and left her with her mama and took off north. We've been looking for her ever since. That's been going on four years now we've been looking. That's the only thing I know how to do. I just want to see her face so I can get me a starting place in the world. The world got to start somewhere. That's what I've been looking for. I've been wandering a long time in somebody else's world. When I find my wife, that'd be the making of my own. Now, I ain't never seen Joe Turner, seen him to where I could touch him. I asked one of them fellows one time why he catch niggas. Ask him what I got he want. Why don't he keep on to himself? Why he got to catch me going down the road by my lonesome? He told me I was worthless. Worthless is something you throw away, something you don't bother with. I ain't seen him throw me away. Wouldn't even let me stay away when I was by my lonesome. I ain't tried to catch him when he going down the road, so I must got something he want. What I got, I can look at him and see where he big and strong enough to do his own work. So it can't be that. He must want something he ain't got. And that's the end of that speech. But so there, there, there's, there's a relentless progression and I was saying in some of, and you know, I did it as well as I could and uh, having not worked on that speech 10, 15 years ago, um, but the, the whole idea is within Wilson, some of his sentences are three words long. He ain't got, could be a sentence, right? And so that's part of the poetry and stringing that together with a certain amount of forward progression and velocity is where 
you need to go or I feel I needed to go as an actor to get to the end point of what I was trying to talk about, which within the context of that speech is this man told me the reason why he got me was because I was worthless. Right. And that's the message that he got. And he's not worthless, but this is what he was told. And this is why Joe Turner rounded up black men by the dozens, because Joe Turner felt that they were worthless and they needed to be slaves again. Right. And then my character, Harold Loomis, is asking, what is it that Joe Turner wants from me? He must want something from me that he ain't got. And what Joe Turner wants is the spirit of Harold Loomis. And as it goes through in the play, it's like the spirit or Harold Loomis's song, the song that you have in your soul, in your spirit, the thing that defines you as who you are and what you are, that connects you back to your African nature. Like that's what he wanted to steal from Loomis so that Loomis would be less than that. And Loomis would think of himself as less than a man, think of himself as an animal, think of himself as worthless. And then Joe Turner's got him exactly where he wants him. So I felt that this play was August Wilson's opus. You know what I mean? This is what he wanted to say a lot about the African, African experience in the United States and what it is, the journey from Africa to the United States, what we lost in that journey, what was taken away from us because the Bible was often used in that sense to make people think that slavery was correct. They preach it to slaves. It's right here in the Bible, this is it. And I felt like what August Wilson was saying and using Harold Loomis as a pastor who lost his job as a pastor once he got arrested to say that that's not it. There is something about your African nature, your, Afri your own African mythology that has been left behind and that was the thing that Joe Turner wanted so bad from these individuals that they rounded up to take that connection away, to leave them desolate and lost in this new land. And so that is what I felt August Wilson was saying is where we can find some understanding and solace is in our African roots more so than in lesson set, more so than in Christian roots within the context of America because they were using the Christian roots to enslave us. You hear in, in, in your reading and that relentless quality that you were yeah. talking about, but, but also how much is piled on the shoulders of, of these singular characters. And mm -hmm. Loomis is obviously one of the great characters in Western literature, but I wanna talk about King Headley a little bit as well. King Headley II, could you talk a little bit about that, that character? And, and again, mm. epic, lots of, lots of words. And, yeah. and, and again, the idea of carrying the world on, on, on his shoulders. Yeah, these characters tend to carry um, so much because there is, as much as there is black joy, there is the suffering and not only the suffering of the individual in the moment, but the suffering of the past that is then carried by that individual on into the future. And with someone like Headley, you know, he's basically trying to turn, turn the corner and do the right thing with his life, but feeling as if that's never gonna happen. It's as if feeling that he has a boot on his neck and he can never get up from under that. And it is epic because I feel with Headley, he's not just dealing with his own particular uh, past. He's dealing with everybody's past yeah. that he has to now bring into the future. And the future doesn't look so bright given the past, the past, which is now defining the present, which is going to define the future. Now, it might yeah. be worthwhile for me to say it. just just briefly. Yeah. Headley starts uh, the, the, the lead character, King. Uh, has just yes. come out of prison and, and he yes. and his friend are selling uh, refrigerators. Refrigerators. refrigerators yeah. uh, to selling refrigerators to make some money because with the, and use that money to open up a VCR store, right? Very so 80s, right? <laughs> the very 80s, right? Um, and they're collecting that money and they're going to put it down and get themselves a business. So it is the American dream. Um, but will it be the American dream for this character. What will prevent 
him from achieving that American dream. And you see he's working hard to get it, right? Um, but it is not only, as I said before, what he's taking from his own present and his own past of coming out of prison, but collectively the journey of his people, which is on his shoulders. And his success is going to define, in a way, his people, or lack thereof, is also going to define his people. So I think I've, I always feel the same with Harold Loomis, that you feel that they are carrying not only their own weight, but the weight of their culture, of their people, and they're cognizant of that. And how they negotiate the present and the future is going to have an effect on all those generations that are gonna come behind them. And the kind of full circle and the idea of yeah. generations and, and, and family. And, and we were talking earlier today about Headley in many ways is, is, is like a Greek tragedy and that sort of mm. cyclical nature of, of, of destruction. And, and could, could you talk a little bit about that? You were chatting with Max the other day about it, especially around the, uh, with the stool pigeon, the character stool pigeon, mm. um, who's this sort of this sage that starts out yeah. the play and has a, a feeling of a Tiresias or, a, or, or even a chorus. Yeah, I mean, there are many aspects of Wilson, at least for me, that, that feel Greek in nature. And if I go back to Shakespeare, Shakespeare certainly borrowed from the Greeks. Shakespeare took stories that were not his, but enhance them through language, through his poetry, through the use of iambic pentameter. Um, but the Greeks have always influenced many great playwrights, and I think they have influenced August Wilson. And so you do see these characters um, like Stool Pigeon, who are, as you said, sages, who, who are looked at maybe as fools or individuals who might be off their rocker, but have the greatest things to say. And he gives them such leverage within their community. And you know, certainly as a reader and sometimes as a watcher of the plays, oh, whatever they're saying, pay real strong attention to. Because they are uh, philosophers, either predicting the future from the past, um, using simple statements that kind of describe very complex ways of thinking. Um, so you get the sense that they know the truth that other people may not know. And I always feel like someone like Stu Pidge is like, follow this guy, follow it. And the characters that are in the play speak about Stool Pigeon from an audience perspective as if you shouldn't follow this character because he may be a little off or something or he does things in a weird way, so don't focus and pay attention. So that makes you wanna pay even more, I'm saying to audience members, <laughs> pay even more attention to this guy because he's got the key to the play. And they always end up in that last saying, saying, I told you so, see what I mean? It's come to pass, you know what I mean? And it's wonderful how August Wilson, you know, dots these plays and drops these characters in many of his, uh, of his plays in, in an effort to look at Greek tragedy and say, uh, lift Greek tragedy as the highest form, perhaps, of play and put it in his plays, making his plays equal to the highest form of play. And Shakespeare did the same thing. Uh, the, the Greeks weren't strong for a simple reason. The Greeks were strong because what they were writing about was also aspects of the human condition. And all the great writers from one century to another borrowed from the Greeks in some format or another, yeah. the way they structured their plays and characters in the plays. And Wilson is, is, is no different. Well, I hope that whets your appetite to go see uh, King Hadley II. Oh, yeah. we, we watched a little bit of tech yesterday, and it's, it's, mm. it looks terrific. It looks really, 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 really good. And I think you'll all be in for quite um, a treat. And, you know, I think the great thing about Hadley is there are similarities from Hadley in the other plays. Um, so it's like opening up this great book and reading a chapter and knowing that in some senses, you can follow these characters through other chapters in the book, but even if you don't follow the characters, each succeeding chapter will be just as exciting and wonderful as that first one that you read. Like when I pick up an August Wilson play to read, it reads to me like a book, and I can't necessarily put it down. You just want to know what's going to happen, not only in the context of the overall story, like how it's going to end, but what is this character going to end up saying? 
Like you're so attached to each statement that the character says that you want to know everything about the character. And I find that some of the simple statements or ordinary or even perfunctory statements in August Wilson's plays contain so much. They're packed. The three simple words may be packed with such density of black life. Um, it, it's, it's quite remarkable how he has put so much of our history in so little. And I think the same thing what Shakespeare did, he put that into the history of the human condition. Because I don't think outside of the history plays, or maybe even the Roman plays, yeah. that Shakespeare was writing about a specific culture. I, thought, I think most of Shakespeare's plays really address human nature, right? That's what makes them so universal. But there is also something quite universal about Wilson because he's asking you to look through this prism, this amazing prism of black life and see the universality in your own life. So it's very specific. Look at this black life, but what you will see is the similarities to your own life because you'll see the characters who have the same wishes, dreams, and statements that you have. So it's not just theater. I always felt this. It's not just theater that exists for a particular group. It's theater like Shakespeare that exists for humanity because we all learn lessons. And what I learned, and I think what the general audience can learn, is the universality of these stories and how these lives, which may not be yours, are so similar in emotion, in reach, in hope, in desire, in anxiety, in love. Um, and I think that is the hallmark of a good playwright, to take something so specific. Uh, let's say if it's a, a Jewish playwright, like when I went to see, um, uh, I've seen quite a few plays that talk about uh, the Jewish story within the context of America. And then what you start to see is your own life through the characters on stage who are a part of Jewish life. And you see the similarities. So that's the thing that great playwrights do is pull us all together through a specificity, through forcing us to look through the prism of something very specific. But when you look through that prism, the way the light bends in many different directions yeah. is what we can gather from it. And that's the universality. Well, it just reminds me, we, we saw that with, with Indecent. The students did yes. Indecent a couple, and I saw a couple Indecent weeks in New ago. York. And, you see the similarities. Yeah, and Aubergine. And, uh, mm -hmm. play. We, um, I'm going to turn it over for some audience questions here in a second, but I, I, I would be remiss not to ask you this, especially for our students who are thinking about um, careers in, in acting. You have a, a successful film career as well, and I know you were just recently uh, in the film Till, mm -hmm. uh, about the story about Emmett Till, and I, I wonder if you maybe could talk a little bit about that, that production, uh, that, that, that show, that, sure. you know, that film. Um, and a little bit about the differences in acting technique uh, uh, that you right. take from the theater, uh, perhaps yeah. the stage. Screen. Well, I, I'll, I'll start first in saying that theater, in comparison to film and television, is, for the actor, is a luxury. Uh, and I say that only because um, what the theater actor gets to do that the film or television actor doesn't get to do is rehearse. That's the X factor. As a theater person, you spend a month in a room rehearsing the character, the ideas of the play, the shape of the play, and, and, and able to fix and correct things and, and, and come to some sort of conclusion with your performance and have it be shaped by a director over time. And then you got eight performances or six to eight performances a week. So if you mess something up on Tuesday, you got Wednesday, you got <laughs> Thursday, you can continually work it. So there's an openness, there's, no, there's not a finality to theater, and there's rehearsal. In film and television, there's very little rehearsal, and there is a finality. So you end up maybe not having enough time to get where you want to be, and then realizing, well, it doesn't matter now because they've filmed it, it's captured, it's there for posterity, there's nothing I can do about it now. We're not going back to refilm or redo, that's it, drop it. So often for me, I won't watch the things that I do uh, as it relates to film and television, because if I look at it and say, yeah, of course, it's, 
in my mind, I'm thinking it's terrible because I didn't have enough time to rehearse it. And I can look at a moment and say, ah, so I don't want to put myself, it's almost traumatic (laughs) in some ways. Because I keep saying like, oh wow, if they just decided to have an extra day of rehearsal. There really is no rehearsal. You gotta come in with a performance and they take it in one or two takes and then that's it. So that's the difference. So if you're a theater actor, just really, understand your blessing and the fact that you have this luxury of rehearsal and it teaches you how to put together a performance, which when you move to film and television, you'll need to do that, but in a very accelerated way. You may only have 24 hours to put together a performance that if you were doing a play, you would have a month to put together a performance. So that's the big acting difference from my perspective. Now, the film Till, was a a fabulously important film and they had asked me to be a part of it and it's rare that you get to be a part of factual films. Most films and even television shows are fiction. So it's being made up on the fly. Uh, So this was a factual film about Emmett Till and it really zeroed in on Emmett Till's mother, Mamie Till, and all that she did surrounding her son's killing and how her work and her determination under such incredible circumstances as a mother to have your son murdered, how she rose above it and actually started the NAACP. It was kind of her efforts that kind of brought that into existence and civil rights as well. Um, So she was very integral in that. So there was this whole idea of, okay, you're playing a character that's real, that was really here, that really existed, so you want to factually get it right, but you also want to try to fill it with the emotion you felt the character felt. And we had FBI transcripts, we had all this information that we could go through as an actor so we can kind of really get to understand our characters and perform them. And because we were dealing with such, such a tragic story, it's, it's truly unbelievably tragic. And what I learned was all these things that I didn't know. I thought I knew about the Emmett Till situation. And I would say this to everyone here, what you think you know, you don't know. There's much more to it um, that happened, that went on, that I think we all should know as we move forward. Um, so it made it the kind of film to work on was very difficult because it was so, we were dealing with suffering. We were dealing with the residuals of black suffering in the making of the movie. But there was also lots of black joy. I mean, one of the simple ways in which they brought that to the set and allowed us to do our work, but also experience joy and happiness in the process of doing the work, instead of and this is a very simple thing, but it has profound consequences. You can have the name of the film, and oftentimes when you're going to the film, you'll be driving by in some truck that they're bringing you into the film on, and it'll say, this way to Till, or this way to the name of the movie, so that the person who's driving you there knows they're going in the right direction. Instead of this way to Till, it was this way to Joy or two set of joy. And I know it's a very simple thing because it is language. It was either till, which we recognize what that story was and the heaviness of it, or the word joy and the lightness and what that implies. And it made a difference in how we showed up for work. And our director was also cognizant of how we would be feeling with this particular subject and did her best uh, as well as the producers to keep things light. Yes, we have to do the work. Let's go inside and do the work. And when the work is over, when I say cut, let us move towards something happy. And it really had an effect on the whole cast. There was, we did one scene, there's a scene that I'm in where they come to take Emmett Till, because I play Emmett Till's uncle, and he feels a huge burden of guilt because it's on his watch that Emmett Gil, Emmett Till gets taken. And I remember doing that scene and we did that at 2 a.m. in the morning. So it was real and this sort of a thing, the real event happened around this time, late, late at night, where these individuals who were obviously Klan members came and took Emmett Till 
from that house. And we really did it under those circumstances uh, of night and late, waking up, tired. We were all physically tired because we've been out there shooting this scene. And so I think some of that lended to, you know, the, I guess, verisimilitude uh, of when people are watching it, it, it's quite truthful and quite accurate as to what actually happened. And so for our making of the film, the director put us all in that situation, knowing how difficult that would be, but that's the kind of work we had to do to get the scene right for the audience to understand the impact of that situation to that family and the idea that there was nothing they could do about it. They had to acquiesce and let this happen. Um, was, that was part of the tragedy. And then we came up with this idea, okay, we're just gonna focus on your face, John, as they drive away with Emmett. And you knowing that there's nothing you can do and how helpless you are in the face of that kind of terror and aggression. So those were the kinds of things in working on the film that were deepful and meaning to us as actors, but we also got to release, you know, I remember one scene we just danced for hours, you know, while we were doing it, whenever we weren't doing the scene, we were dancing. Um, and that helps, that helped take our mind. But it was an honor to be a part of something that was historical, that I felt is necessary for people to see and to hear and experience and really on this, understand this story, the true nature of this story, because it's impactful. And we keep sometimes running into these things without knowing the past in an effort to avoid these things. You know what I mean? So, yeah. I, uh, and then I did some series. I did mm, The Mayor of East Town, uh, which was on HBO. And I'm doing another show called The Gilded Age, which is which is really, and also significant, they decided to really focus in on a black family yeah. of that time. We're talking um, not early, late 19th century, um, who were quite wealthy. And it's not fiction because these people existed. But the reality is when we watch television, these costume dramas, we're never included as if we didn't exist in that past. And if we did exist, um, it's certainly on a subservient level. So with Gilded Age, we really wanted to look at wealth um, and agency that this particular family, which I am the patriarch of, actually have. And it, as I said, it's not fiction. There were many of these families that lived in Brooklyn that did quite well for themselves and quite well in their community and helping other members of them, their community do well for themselves. So the fact that Julian Fellows, who did... Um, Downton Abbey was willing to focus and hone in on this and have that be a part of this greater story, I feel is some sort of an advancement in telling black stories within the context of costume dramas, which a lot of people love. I remember watching Downton Abbey, and I don't think I ever saw a black person on that show. So I was like, black people didn't exist then? Or, or we are we had so little value to what you wanted to do that we couldn't be incorporated or included. And this is the message that gets sent to the viewer who's watching it, you know, particularly the black viewer. So the fact that HBO went out of their way to incorporate our stories, and there'll be more of that within the context of season two, which I think gets released in September, is I think a huge step forward. More work to be done, but a huge step forward. Thank you, John. Look. Um, I, what I thought we'd do, just given the time and given the fact that there's cookies and beverages, oh. <laughs> would you join us to mingle for a bit? Oh, absolutely. Since, yeah. So why don't we, we, we do all the questions and so forth over cookies and, and whatever. What did we order? I think hot chocolate oh, or something. Um, oh, yeah. But I, before, before we, we adjourn, I, I just I want to say a couple of things by way of stage management here. Um, King Headley II opens at TheaterWorks this week. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to say that the students are doing an extraordinary sh uh, play, Circle Mirror Transformation, oh, yeah, which we got to see a little tech of yesterday. I hope all of you will go to that. Seth Lindsay is directing it. It's going to be wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to do a prologue next week about that play. 
Um, so that'll be on, on Sunday at 2.30 upstairs, and it's going to be about deep listening, uh, and Professor Jane Rigler will be joining us for that. Deep so that was listening. deep listening. It's deep fascinating, listening. actually. Um, so there's so much wonderful theater coming up, and, um, and, I, and I just I, I want to uh, take this moment. I, I tell people all the time, I'm, I'm not that cool, but I have very cool <laughs> friends. And, and John Douglas Thompson is one of them. It is a pleasure to have you, sir. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome.